Please bow your head for a prayer for illumination. Almighty God, on this morning in Jerusalem, your son entered the city to loud voices of acclaim. All too soon, those praises turn to accusations. We follow along singing, then astonish and dismay ourselves by joining the accusers. Let your Holy Spirit teach us in these moments. Give us strength to turn from rejecting your freely offered salvation in him. We pray in the beloved name of him who intercedes for us, Jesus, our resurrected Lord and only Savior. Amen. You can look in your pew Bibles on uh, page 565, uh, reading Psalm 118, verses 1 and 2, and 19 through 29. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say, his love endures forever. Open for me the gates of the righteous. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks, for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it's marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is good, and he has made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, join us in the fest, festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you so much. That was a great reading. A recap of last week, we talked about the fact that our faith needs to be an audience of one. And that means that as individuals, we have to know the one who is number one in our lives. It can't be us. As Christians, it is only one. And that's our resurrected Lord and, and our only Savior. This week, we are responding with a historical view of this, an affirmation, really, of what is happening on this day. And just as I shared with the kids, if you were an Israelite, you knew when you heard certain words exactly what was going on. When Luke writes the cornerstone which the builder rejected has become the foundation, then you know that something's going on here. You know that there's a coronation. You know that somebody is getting crowned as king. With that in mind, listen to the Gospel of Luke, the 19th chapter, verse 28 through verse 40. If you're going to read along, it's on the 83rd page in the New Testament in your pew Bible. Listen now for the word of the Lord. After he said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem, and when he had come near Bethpage and Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it, bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? Just say this, The Lord needs it. So those who were sent, they departed, and they found it as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner asked them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord needs it. And then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they said, the Lord, they, said Jesus, they sat Jesus upon it. And as he rode along, the people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. 
And as he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds and the power that they had seen. And they were saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and peace in the highest heaven. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd, they said to him, Teacher, order these disciples to stop. And he answered them, I tell you, if they were silenced, the stones would shout out. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When I say to you, chop down the cherry tree, you say, George Washington. When I say you, honest Abe. Our history draws us together as a people. Our history reminds us who we are. More absurdly, if you are my age and somebody puts on a film called the Rocky Horror Picture Show, you know that when certain words come on, you throw popcorn. And you know that when a certain song comes on, you put your knees together and you do a dance. I'm not going to do the dance, but you do a dance. An action brings a reaction when you know what it means. Luke is quoting the 118th Psalm. And he's quoting it, and even as he quotes it, the people know exactly what is going on. As the disciples cry out about the righteousness of God, the people immediately understand what's going on here. There's a coronation. There's a cornerstone that is being set. And if you heard the scripture that was written, it said the cornerstone that the builders rejected is the cornerstone upon which the king builds the kingdom. This cornerstone, this cornerstone is it's set on the foundation. It's the first stone that's laid in and it has to have integrity. It has to be able to withhold the pressures of the building that will come above it. It has to take on the pressures of the building. And if it doesn't, if it isn't a good stone, if it doesn't have integrity, it will crumble and the building will crumble. What the disciples have realized and they have voiced in this psalm is that the one that is coming is not just a teacher, but he's a king. And the character of that king, you hear it time in and time out of Psalm 118. It's the righteousness of God. That word is chesed. Chesed, which literally means the rightness, the loving kindness of God, the grace of God, the salvation of God, the character of God that doesn't change. That's the character of this king that is coming on a donkey, headed toward the gate. Also, did you hear in Psalm 118 that, that the Savior, the King, comes to the gate and he asks for admittance? There's a gatekeeper. This is on the, on the left, a picture of the temple. And that was the gate, the beautiful gate. That was the gate that led immediately into the temple. And that was the gate that the king, who was going to be coronated, was going to be anointed, that's what they did to kings, 
was going to go through that gate, generally on a donkey. I don't know why, but even archaeologists have found in king's tombs donkeys on a donkey to be anointed. You see on the left what it would have looked like with the temple, and you see on the right and the top what it looks like today with the mosque. Still a place of worship, but not the worship of the Jews, not the worship of the people of Israel. The worship of another creed. Do you see in front of that, and you probably can't see it, so just, just bear with me. In front of the, the, the beautiful gate today, which has been sealed, and been sealed for centuries, is a cemetery. It's a Muslim cemetery. And the reason that it is there is because the Muslims understood that the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah, would come through that gate when he came to rule and to free the people. And so thinking that a righteous God would never walk through a cemetery, they placed the cemetery there. But we know that the gatekeeper has already admitted the Savior through that gate. We know that though you may seal it, someday it will be unsealed. That the feet of the one who brings redemption and, and salvation, those beautiful, beautiful feet, have already passed through that gate. But if you are also an Israelite, you would remember that that gate was the gate that David came through as well. The cue here that they got it was all about the cloaks. You see, when David found, and I mean found, the Ark of the Covenant, you remember King Saul had allowed the Ark of the Covenant to go out in battle and to be captured. Before David, they didn't know where the Ark of the Covenant was, the presence of God. They didn't know where it was. David found it, and he brought it back in. You see, when the people saw Jesus coming on a donkey, they remembered. They remembered King David. They remembered the ascension to the temple. They remembered the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God coming back into their temple, into their hearts, into their lives. And just as on that day with David, this day when God's presence was coming back into the temple, they laid down their cloaks. Jesus is the righteous king, God's presence. But the other thing that they might have wondered but remembered in their history was that the great men and women that God used were rarely the ones you expected. I pray and I think that in the minds of those who were there that day, they wondered, huh, this man will be our Messiah? But they remembered King David. And do you remember how Samuel wondered who the new king would be that God would anoint? And it wasn't the good-looking older brothers. It was the shepherd on the hill. And, and Moses it wasn't Pharaoh, and it wasn't a king. It was a young boy that had been found in the rushes, a young man who had murdered an Egyptian, uh, an alien in a foreign land that God called back, a man with a stutter and a lisp that God would give the words to. You see... The righteous king that God brings is very often the stone that the builders reject. 
God is the one that chooses the leader. And it's rarely going to be the one that we expect. Jesus, the transcendent one, we heard that in verses 26 through 29, where it described this God that is not just up in the sky, but the God that breaks through the barriers and is with us. Do you see how all of these words would have, have infiltrated and would, have, would just have filled the people with joy? But there's one verse that I don't even think they understood the meaning of, but Jesus did. And if you're still looking at that Old Testament text, Psalm 118, if you look at the 27th verse, there's something very powerful happening there. The scripture says, bring the sacrifice. The scripture said, make the festal steps to the altar. But that word bring, it means much, much more, and it's found only one other place in the Bible. And that is in the crowning of Yehu. Do you remember the story? King Ahab, oh, one of the worst kings that we ever had, his wife Jezebel. She was a feisty one. And all the prophets, whether they, they might have been killed or they were in hiding. And God would stomach it no longer. And so God had the prophet send an emissary. He had them send it to Yehu, who was a captain in the army. And he said, go and tell Yehu, I am anointing you king because God will not stomach any longer the abuses and the wrongheartedness of this king, Yehu, of this king Ahab. And so the emissary goes and he brings the oil and all of the people that are subject to this, this, this commander, they throw down their coats and he, he bows upon them. He is anointed and he goes back and he restores the northern kingdom to a, a king who listens to God. That is what is happening here. That is what is happening and must happen in all of our lives, too. Because here's the danger and here's the warning. The danger is that we don't pay attention to this call to bring the sacrifice. But Jesus did. He understood that he was being anointed. That one word. And he understood as well that he was the sacrifice and that he wouldn't be tied to that altar. He would be nailed to the cross. You see, even in the midst of all of the rejoicing, Jesus understood what it would take to be the kind of king that would lead his people out of sin and death. I don't think that we are a lot different, quite frankly, from the people of those days. I love Palm Sunday. It's one of my favorite Sundays of the entire year. I remember as a child walking down that long, long aisle in my home church, waving the palms and putting them down in front of the Lord's table. But there are other aspects of my life that have not been so happy. There have been moments when I have walked through things, and perhaps you have too, that confounded me and that I couldn't understand and frankly broke my heart. And that's when I needed a king that was better than just a good-looking one, better than somebody with a lot of power and authority better than somebody that had all these rules that somehow I couldn't live up to. 
I needed a king that was not only anointed, but would sacrifice himself for me and do for me what I could not do for myself. The Pharisees in our scripture, they told Jesus to quiet the crowd. They didn't like Jesus because he didn't do things the way they should be done. He wasn't that cornerstone that was finished the way they liked it. They forgot that God sends what they need, not what they want. Palm Sunday is a day that we all, and I'm so glad that it's the end of Lent, because it really is the crowning question, isn't it? Will I live into the life with a Savior who is not what I expect, but what I need? Will I take this Savior and, like him, resolutely follow the path that God has put in my life? Do you remember that first week in Lent when we said that the whole purpose of our lives is God's plan of salvation, and it's going on, and we're a part of it as much as Moses, as much as Jesus, as much as Paul. We are a part of that. And we need a Savior that reminds us that no matter what happens, no matter what they face, that they understand, number one, they're anointed and called, and number two, that they will go through suffering, but that they, number three, serve a righteous chesed God. There is, there is no reason There's no, I mean, it makes total sense that this happened before Holy Week. Because people needed then to be reminded, and we need to be reminded now, that this faith that we live into is not about our plans. It's not about the way we want things to look. It's not even about the tragedies in our lives. It's about the righteousness of a God who is not only Lord, who is the cornerstone that we need, even if it doesn't look like we think it should, but is the one that not only will go through trials, but will go through death. (laughs) As a church, in the culture that we live today, If we don't have faith like that, my friends, then we will have faith like the Pharisees, and there's no power behind it, and there's no salvation behind it, and there is, (laughs) well, you saw the picture. There's no temple up there anymore. But God's plan of salvation continues. Many people will not be there (laughs) On resurrection morning, there will be very few there. But the ones who are there, they not only see the power of the king, but they are given the gift of eternal life in him. Friends, if he is not your Lord and your king, if you do not cry out in praise of him, this world that needs that kind of salvation, that kind of promise, that kind of assurance, that kind of eternal life, the stones will cry out. God's plan of salvation will go forward. The question is, on this Palm Sunday, (laughs) Will I lay down the coat? Will I lay down the palm? Will I cry out, Hosanna, save me? And will I know that Jesus is Lord and that God's plan of salvation is my life?
Amen.